Hello and welcome. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time. This week and all month long, we bring you African American authors in honor of Black History Month. Our first author is Alice Dunbar Nelson, born Alice Ruth Moore. Moore was the daughter of an African American seamstress and former slave, and a white seaman. Her parents were middle class people of color and part of the traditional multiracial Creole community in New Orleans. She recalls the isolation felt as a child and the sensation of not belonging to or being accepted by either race. Both black and white individuals rejected her for being too white. Much of Dunbar Nelson's writing was rejected because she wrote about the color line, oppression, and the themes of racism. Few mainstream publications would publish her writing because it was not marketable. She was able to publish her writing, however, when the themes of racism and oppression were more subtle. Here are four stories by Alice Dunbar Nelson, Sister Josepha, Tati, Tony's Wife, and By the Bayou St. John. And now, Sister Josepha. Sister Josepha told her beads mechanically, her fingers numb with the accustomed exercise. The little organ creaked a dismal O oh, salutaris, and she still knelt on the floor, her white bonneted head nodding suspiciously. The mother superior gave a sharp glance at the tired figure. Then, as a sudden lurch forward brought the little sister back to consciousness, mother's eyes relaxed into a genuine smile. The bell tolled the end of the vespers, and the somber-robed nuns filed out of the chapel to go to their evening duties. Little Sister Josepha's work was to attend to the household lamps, but there must have been as much oil spilled on the table tonight as was put in the vessels. The small brown hands trembled so that most of the wicks were trimmed with points at one corner, which caused them to smoke all that night. Oh, cher senor, she sighed, giving an impatient polish to a refractory chimney. It is wicked and sinful, I know, but I'm so tired. I can't be happy and sing any more. It doesn't seem right for le bon Dieu to have me all cooped up here with nothing to see but stray visitors, and always the same old work, teaching those mean little girls to sew, and washing and filling the same old lamps. Pah! And she polished the chimney, with a sudden vigorous jerk which threatened destruction. They were rebellious prayers that the red mouth murmured that night, and a restless figure that tossed on the hard dormitory bed. Sister Dominica called from her couch to know if Sister Josepha were ill. No, was the somewhat short response. Then a muttered, Why can't they let me alone for a minute? That pale-eyed Sister Dominica never sleeps. That's why she is so ugly. About fifteen years before this night, someone had brought to the orphan asylum connected with this convent du sacre coeur, a round, dimpled bit of three-year-old humanity who regarded the world from a pair of gravely twinkling black eyes and only took a chubby thumb out of a rosy mouth long enough to answer in monosyllabic French. It was a child without an identity. There was but one name that anyone seemed to know, and that too was vague. Camille. She grew up with the rest of the waifs, scraps of French and American civilization thrown together to develop a seemingly inconsistent miniature world. Mademoiselle Camille was a queen among them, a pretty little tyrant who ruled the children and dominated the more timid sisters in charge. One day, an awakening came, when she was fifteen and almost fully ripened into a glorious tropical beauty of the type that matures early, some visitors to the convent were fascinated by her and asked the mother superior to give the girl into their keeping. Camille fled like a frightened fawn into the yard and was only unearthed with some difficulty from behind a group of palms. Sulky and pouting, she was led into the parlor, picking at her blue pinafore like a spoiled infant. "'The lady and gentleman wish you to go home with them, Camille,' said the mother superior, in the language of the convent. Her voice was kind and gentle, apparently. 
that the child, accustomed to its various inflections, detected a steely ring behind its softness, like the proverbial iron hand in the velvet glove. "'You must understand, madam,' continued Mother in stilted English, "'that we never force children from us. "'We are glad to place them in comfortable... "'How you say that? Quarters? Masons? Homes? Bien. "'But we will not make them go if they do not wish.' Camille stole a glance at her would-be guardians and decided instantly, impulsively, finally. The woman suited her, but the man. It was doubtless intuition of the quick, vivacious sort which belonged to her blood that served her. Untutored in worldly knowledge, she could not divine the meaning of the pronounced leers and admiration of her physical charms which gleamed in the man's face, but she knew it made her feel creepy and stoutly refused to go. Next day, Camille was summoned from a task to the Mother Superior's parlor. The other girls gazed with envy upon her as she dashed down the courtyard with impetuous movement. Camille, they decided crossly, received too much notice. It was Camille this, Camille that. She was pretty, it was to be expected. Even Father Ray lingered longer in his blessing when his hands were pressing her silky black hair. Entered the parlor, a strange chill swept over the girl. The room was not an unaccustomed one, for she had swept it many times. But today, the stiff black chairs, the dismal crucifix, the gleaming whiteness of the walls, even the cheap lithograph of the Madonna, which Camille had always regarded as a perfect specimen of art, seemed cold and mean. Camille, ma chérie, said Mother, I am extremely displeased with you. Why did you not wish to go with Monsieur and Madame La Fay yesterday? The girl uncrossed her hands from her bosom and spread them out in a deprecating gesture. Mais, ma mère, I was afraid. Mother's face grew stern. No foolishness now, she exclaimed. It is not foolishness, ma mère. I could not help it, but that man looked at me so funny. I felt all cold chills down my back. Oh, dear mother, I love the convent and the sisters so. I just want to stay and be a sister too. May I? And thus it was that Camille took the white veil at sixteen years. Now that the period of novitiate was over, it was beginning to dawn upon her that she had made a mistake. Maybe it would have been better had I gone with the funny-looking lady and gentleman, she mused bitterly one night. Oh, senor, I'm so tired and impatient. It's so dull here. And, dear God, I'm so young. There was no help for it. One must arise in the morning and help in the refractory with the stupid sister Francesca and go about one's duties with a prayerful mien, and not even let a sigh escape when one's head ached with the eternal telling of beads. A great fete day was coming, and an atmosphere of preparation and mild excitement pervaded the brown walls of the convent like a delicate aroma. The old cathedral around the corner had stood a hundred years, and all the city was rising to do honor to its age and time-softened beauty. There would be a service, oh, but such a one, with two cardinals and archbishops and bishops and all the accompanying glitter of soldiers and orchestras, the little sisters of the convent de Sacré-Cœur clasped their hands in anticipation of the holy joy. Sister Josepha curled her lip. She was so tired of churchly pleasures. The day came, a gold and blue spring day, when the air hung heavy like the scent of roses and magnolias, and the sunbeams fairly laughed as they kissed the houses. The old cathedral stood gray and solemn, and the flowers of Jackson Square smiled cheery birthday greetings across the way. The crowd around the door surged and pressed and pushed in its eagerness to get within. Ribbons stretched across the banquette were of no avail to repress it, and important ushers with cardinal colors could do little more. The Sacred Heart Sisters filed slowly in at the side door, creating a momentary flutter as they paced reverently to their seats, guarding the blue-bonneted orphans. 
Sister Josepha, determined to see as much of the world as she could, kept her big black eyes opened wide as the church rapidly filled with the fashionably dressed, perfumed, rustling, and self-conscious throng. Her heart beat quickly. The rebellious thoughts that will arise in the most philosophical of us surged in her small, heavily gowned bosom. For her were the gray things, the neutral-tinted skies, the ugly garb, the coarse meats. For them, the rainbow, the ethereal airness of earthly joys, the bonbons and the glaces of the world. Sister Josepha did not know that the rainbow is elusive and its colors but the illumination of tears. She had never been told that earthly ethereality is necessarily ephemeral, nor that bonbons and glaces, whether of the palate or of the soul, nauseate and pall upon the taste. Dear God, forgive her, for she bent with contrite tears over her worn rosary and glanced no more at the worldly glitter of femininity. The sunbeams streamed through the high windows in purple and crimson lights upon a veritable fugue of color. Within the seats, crush upon crush of spring millinery, within the aisles, erect lines of gold-braided, gold-buttoned military. Upon the altar, broad sweeps of golden robes, great dashes of crimson skirts, mitres and gleaming crosses, the soft, neutral hue of rich lace vestments, the tender heads of childhood in picturesque attire, the proud golden magnificence of the domed altar with its waiting mass of lilies and wide-eyed roses, and the long candles that sparkled their yellow star points above the reverent throng within the altar rails. The soft baritone of the cardinal intoned a single phrase in the suspended silence. The censer took up the note in its delicate clink, clink, as it swung to and fro in the hands of a fair-haired child. Then the organ, pausing an instant in a deep, mellow, long-drawn note, burst suddenly into a magnificent strain, and the choir sang forth. One voice, flute-like, piercing, sweet, rang high over the rest. Sister Josepha heard and trembled as she buried her face in her hands and let her tears fall like other beads through her rosary. It was when the final word of the service had been intoned, the last peal of the exit march had died away, that she looked up meekly to encounter a pair of youthful brown eyes gazing pityingly upon her. That was all she remembered for a moment, that the eyes were youthful and handsome and tender. Later, she saw that they were placed in a rather beautiful boyish face, surmounted by waves of brown hair, curling and soft, and that the head was set on a pair of shoulders decked in military uniform. Then the brown eyes marched away with the rest of the rear guard, and the white bonneted sisters filed out the side door through the narrow court back into the brown convent. That night, Sister Josepha tossed more than usual on her hard bed and clasped her fingers often in prayer, to quell the wickedness in her heart. Turn where she would, pray as she might, there was ever a pair of tender, pitying brown eyes haunting her persistently. The squeaky organ at vespers intoned the clank of military accoutrements to her ears. The white bonnets of the sisters about her faded into mists of curling brown hair. Briefly, Sister Josepha was in love. The days went on pretty much as before, save for the one little heart that beat rebelliously now and then, though it tried so hard to be submissive. There was the morning work in the refractory, the stupid little girls to teach sewing, and the insatiable lamps that were so greedy for oil, and always the tender boyish brown eyes that looked so sorrowfully at the fragile, beautiful little sister, haunting, following, pleading. Perchance, had Sister Josepha been in the world, the eyes would have been an incident. But in this home of self-repression and retrospection, it was a life story. The eyes had gone their way, doubtless forgetting the little sister they pitied. But the little sister? The days glided into weeks, the weeks into months. 
Thoughts of escape had come to Sister Josepha, to flee the world, to merge in the great city where recognition was impossible, and, working her way like the rest of humanity, perchance encounter the eyes again. It was all planned and ready. She would wait until some morning when the little band of black-robed sisters wended their way to Mass at the cathedral. When it was time to file out the side door into the courtway, she would linger at prayers, then slip out another door and, unseen, glide up Chartry Street to Canal, and once there, mingle in the throng that filled the wide thoroughfare. Beyond this first plan, she could think no further. Penniless, garbed, and shaven though she would be, other difficulties never presented themselves to her. She would rely on the mercies of the world to help her escape from this torturing life of inertia. It seemed easy now that the first step of decision had been taken. The Saturday night before the final day had come, she had lay feverishly nervous in her narrow little bed, wondering with wide-eyed fear at the morrow. Pale-eyed Sister Dominica and Sister Francesca were whispering together in the dark silence, and Sister Josepha's ears pricked up as she heard her name. She is not well, poor child, said Francesca. I fear the life is too confining. It is best for her, was the reply. You know, sister, how hard it would be for her in the world, with no name but Camille, no friends, and her beauty. And then... Sister Josepha heard no more, for her heart beating tumultuously in her bosom drowned the rest. Like the rush of the bitter salt tide over a drowning man, clinging to a spar, came the complete submerging of her hopes of another life. No name but Camille, that was true. No nationality, for she could never tell from whom or whence she came. No friends, and a beauty that not even an ungainly bonnet and shaven head could hide. In a flash, she realized the deception of the life she would lead, and the cruel self-torture of wonder at her own identity. Already, as if in anticipation of the world's questionings, she was asking herself, Who am I? What am I? The next morning, the sisters de sucre filed into the cathedral at high mass and bent devout knees at the general confession. Confess to the Almighty, murmured the priest, and trembling, one little sister followed the words, I confess to God Almighty that I have sinned a lot by thought. It is my fault. It is my fault. It's my very great fault. The organ pealed forth as mass ended. The throng slowly filed out and the sisters paced through the courtway back into the brown convent walls. One paused at the entrance and gazed with swift longing eyes in the direction of narrow, squalid Chartres Street. Then, with a gulping sob, followed the rest and vanished behind the heavy door. And now, to tea. It was cold that day. The great sharp north wind swept out of Elysian Field Street in blasts that made men shiver and bent everything in their track. The skies hung lowering and gloomy. The usual quiet street was more than deserted. It was dismal. To tea leaned against one of the brown freight cars for protection against the shrill norther and warmed his little chapped hands at a blaze of chips and dry grass. Maybe it'll snow, he muttered, casting a glance at the sky that would have done credit to a practiced seaman. Then won't I have fun? Ugh, but the wind blows. It was Saturday, or to tea would have been in school, the big yellow school bus on Marine Street, where he went every day when its bell boomed nine o'clock, went with a run and a joyous whoop, ostensibly to imbibe knowledge, really to make his teacher's life a burden. Idle, lazy, dirty, troublesome boy, she called him to herself, as day by day wore on, and to tea improved not, but let his whole class pass him on its way to a higher grade. 
A practical joke he relished infinitely more than a practical problem, and a good game at pin-sticking was far more entertaining than a language lesson. Moreover, he was always hungry, and would eat in school before the half-past ten recess, thereby losing much good playtime for his voracious appetite. But there was nothing in natural history that Titi did not know. He could dissect a butterfly or a mosquito hawk and describe their parts as accurately as a speckled student with a scalpel and a microscope could talk about a cadaver. The entire third district, with its swamps and canals and commons and railroad sections, and its wondrous, crooked, torturous streets, was an open book to Tati. There was not a nook or corner that he did not know or could tell of. There was not a bit of gossip among the gamins, little Creole and Spanish fellows, with dark skins and lovely eyes like spaniels, that Tati could not tell of. He knew just exactly when it was time for crawfish to be plentiful down in the Claiborne and Marinay canals. Just when a poor, breadless fellow might get a job at the big boneyard and fertilizing factory out on the railroad track. And as for the levee, with its ships and schooners and sailors, how he could revel in them! The wondrous ships, the pretty little schooners, where the foreign-looking sailors lay on long moonlight nights, singing to their guitars and telling great stories. All these things and more could Titi tell of. He had been down to the gulf and out on its treacherous waters, through the eads jetting on a fishing smack with some jolly brown sailors, and could interest the whole schoolroom in the talk lessons if he chose. Titi shivered as the wind swept round the freight cars. There isn't much warmth in a bit of a jersey coat. Wish twas summer, he murmured, casting another sailor's glance at the sky. Don't believe I like snow. It's too wet and cold. And with a last parting caress at the little fire he had builded for a minute's warmth, he plunged his hands in his pockets, shut his teeth, and started manfully on his mission out the railroad track toward the swamps. It was late when Tati came home, to such a home as it was, and he had but illly performed his errand, so his mother beat him and sent him to bed supperless. A sharp strap stings in cold weather, and a long walk in the teeth of a biting wind creates a keen appetite. But if Tati cried himself to sleep that night, he was up bright and early next morning, had been to Mass, devoutly kneeling on the cold floor, blowing his fingers to keep them warm, and was home almost before the rest of the family were awake. There was evidently some great matter of business of the young man's mind, for he scarcely ate his breakfast, and left the table soon, eagerly cramming the remainder of his meal in his pockets. Ma foi, but what now? mused his mother, as she watched his little form sturdily trudging the track in the face of the wind. His head, with the rimless cap thrust close on the shock of black hair, bent low, his hands thrust deep in the bulging pockets. A new live plate I hit, maybe, ventured the father. He's one funny child. The next day, Titi was late for school. It was something unusual, for he was always the first on hand to fix some plan of mechanism to make the teacher miserable. She looked reprovingly at him this morning when he came in during arithmetic class, his hair all wind-blown, his cheeks rosy from a hard fight with the sharp blasts. But he made up for his tardiness by his extreme goodness all day. Just think, Titi did not even eat once before noon, a something unparalleled in the entire previous history of his school life. When the lunch hour came, and all the yard was a scene of feast and fun, one of the boys found him standing by a post, disconsolately watching a ham sandwich as it rapidly disappeared down the throat of a sturdy, square-headed little fellow. Hello, Edgar, he said. What you got for lunch? Nothing, was the mournful reply. Ah, why don't you stop eating in school for a change? You don't ever have nothing to eat. I didn't eat today, said Titi, blazing up. You did. I tell you I didn't. And Titi's hard little fist planted a punctuation mark on his comrade's eye. A fight in the schoolyard. Poor Titi was in disgrace again. Still, in spite of his battered appearance 
a severe scolding from the principal, lines to write, and a further punishment from his mother, Titi scarcely remained for his dinner, but was off down the railroad track with his pockets partly stuffed with the remnants of the scanty meal. And the next day, Titi was tardy again, and lunchless too, and the next, until the teacher, in despair, sent a nicely printed note to his mother about him, which might have done some good, had not Titi taken great pains to tear it up on the way home. One day it rained, whole buckets full of water that poured in torrents from a miserable, angry sky. Too wet a day for bits of boys to be trudging to school, so Titi's mother thought, so she kept him at home to watch the weather through the window, fretting and fuming like a regular storm in miniature. As the day wore on and the rain did not abate, his mother kept a strong watch upon him, for he tried many times to slip away. Dinner came and went, and the gray soddenness of the skies deepened into the blackness of coming night. Someone called to tea to go to bed, and to tea was nowhere to be found. Under the beds, in closets and corners, in such impossible places as the soap dish and water pitcher even, they searched— but he had gone as completely as if he had been spirited away. It was of no use to call up the neighbors. He had never been near their houses, they affirmed, so there was nothing to do but go to the railroad track where Titi had been seen so often trudging in the shrill north wind. With lanterns and sticks and his little yellow dog, the rescuing party started down the track. The rain had ceased falling, but the wind blew a gale scurrying great gray clouds over a fierce sky. It was not exactly dark, though in this part of the city there is neither gas nor electricity, and on such a night as this, neither moon nor stars dare show their face in so gray a sky. But a sort of all-diffused luminosity was in the air, as though the sea of atmosphere was charged with an ethereal phosphorescence. Search as they did, there were no signs of Tati, the soft earth between the railroad ties crumbled between their feet without showing any small tracks or footprints. "'May, we may as well return,' said the big brother. "'He's not here.' "'Oh, mon Dieu,' urged the mother. "'He is, he is, I know it!' So on they went, slipping on the wet earth, stumbling over the loose rocks, until a sudden wild yelp from Tiger brought them to a standstill, he had rushed ahead of them, and his voice could be heard in the distance, howling piteously. With fresh impetus, the little muddy party hurried forward. Tiger's yelps could be heard plainer and plainer, mingled now with a muffled, plaintive little wail. After a while they found a pitiful little heap of sodden rags lying at the foot of a mound of earth and stones thrown upon the side of the track. It was Tati with a broken leg, all wet and miserable and moaning. They picked him up tenderly and started to carry him home, but he cried and clung to his mother and begged not to go. Ah, oh, mon pauvre infant, he has the fever, wailed the mother. No, no, it's my old man, he's hungry, sobbed to tea, holding out a little package. It was the remnants of his dinner, all wet and rainwashed. What old man? asked the big brother. My old man, oh, please, please don't go home till I see him. I'm not hurting much. I can go. So, yielding to his whim, they carried him farther away down the sides of the track, up to an embankment or levee by the sides of the Marinay Canal. Then the big brother, suddenly stopping, exclaimed, Why, here's a cave. Is it Robinson Crusoe? It's my old man's cave, cried Tati. Oh, please go in. Maybe he's dead. There cannot be much ceremony in entering a cave. There is but one thing to do. Walk in. This they did, and holding up a lantern, beheld a weird sight. On a bed of straw and paper in one corner lay a withered, wizened, white-bearded old man with wide eyes staring at the unaccustomed light. In the other corner was an equally dilapidated cow. It's my old man, cried Tati joyfully. Oh, please, Grandpa, I couldn't get here today. It rained all morning, and when I ran away, I fell down and broke something. And, oh, Grandpa, 
I'm all tired and hurty, and I'm so afraid you're hungry. So the secret of Tati's jaunts down the railroad was out. In one of his trips around the swampland, he had discovered the old man, exhausted from cold and hunger in the fields. Together they had found this cave, and Tati had gathered the straw and paper that made the bed. Then a tramp cow, old and turned adrift too, had crept in and shared the damp dwelling. And thither Tati had trudged twice a day, carrying his luncheon in the morning and his dinner in the afternoon. "'There's a crown in heaven for that child,' said the officer of charity, to whom the case was referred. But as for Tati, when the leg was well, he went his way as before. And now, Tony's wife. Give me five cents worth of candy, please. It was the little Jewish girl who spoke, and Tony's wife roused herself from her knitting to rise and count out the multi-hued candy which should go in exchange for the dingy nickel grasped in warm, damp fingers. Three long sticks, carefully wrapped in crispest brown paper, and a half dozen or more of pink candy fish for lanyap, and the little Jewish girl sped away in blissful contentment. Tony's wife resumed her knitting with a stifled sigh, until the next customer should come. A low growl caused her to look up apprehensively, Tony himself stood beetle-browed and huge in the small doorway. Get up from there, he muttered, and open two dozen oysters right away. The Elliots want em. His English was unaccented. It was long since he had seen Italy. She moved meekly behind the counter and began work on the thick shelves. Tony stretched his long neck up the street. Mr. Tony, Mama wants some charcoal. A very small voice at his feet must have pleased him, for his black brows relaxed into a smile, and he poked the little one's chin with a hard, dirty finger as he emptied the ridiculously small bucket of charcoal into the child's bucket, and gave him a banana for lanyap. The crackling of shells went on behind, and a stifled sob arose as a bit of sharp edge cut into the thin, worn fingers that clasped the knife. Hurry up there, will ya? growled the black brows. The Elliots are sending for the oysters. She deftly strained and counted them, and after wiping her fingers, resumed her seat and took up the endless crochet work with her usual stifled sigh. Tony and his wife had always been in this little queer old shop on Britannia Street, at least to the memory of the oldest inhabitant of the neighborhood. When or how they came or how they stayed, no one knew, it was enough that they were there, like a sort of ancestral fixture to the street. The neighborhood was fine enough to look down upon these two tumble-down shops at the corner, kept by Tony and Mrs. Murphy, the grocer. It was a semi-fashionable locality, far uptown, away from the old-time French Quarter. It was the sort of neighborhood where millionaires live, before their fortunes are made, and fashionable high-priced private schools flourish, where the small cottages are occupied by aspiring school teachers and choir singers. Such was this locality, and you must admit that it was indeed a condescension to tolerate Tony and Mrs. Murphy. He was a great black-bearded, horse-voiced, six-foot specimen of Italian humanity, who looked in his little shop and on the prosaic pavement of Britannia Street, somewhat like Hercules might seem in a modern drawing room, you instinctively thought of wild mountain passes and the gleaming dirks of bandit Contadini in looking at him. What his last name was, no one knew. Someone had maintained once that he had been christened Antonio Malatesta, but that was unauthentic, and as little to be believed as that other wild theory that her name was Mary. She was meek, pale, little, ugly, and German. Altogether, part of his arms and legs would have very decently made another larger than she. Her hair was pale and drawn in sleek, thin tightness away from a pinched, pitiful face whose dull, cold eyes hurt you because you knew they were trying to mirror sorrow and could not because of their expressionless quality. No matter what the weather or what her other toilette, 
She always wore a thin little shawl of dingy brick dust hue about her shoulders. No matter what the occasion or what the day, she always carried her knitting with her, and seldom ceased the incessant twist, twist of the shining steel among the white cotton meshes. She might put down the needles and lace into the spool box long enough to open oysters or wrap up fruit and candy, or count out wool and coal into infinitesimal portions, or do her housework, but the knitting was snatched with avidity at the first spare moment, and the worn, white, blue-marked fingers, half-closed in kid glove stalls for protection, would writhe and twist in and out again. Little girls just learning to crochet borrowed their patterns from Tony's wife, and it was considered quite a mark of advancement to have her inspect a bit of lace done by eager, chubby fingers. The ladies in larger houses, whose husbands would be millionaires some day, bought her lace and gave it to their servants for Christmas presents. As for Tony, when she was slow in opening his oysters or in cooking his red beans and spaghetti, he roared at her and prefixed picturesque adjectives to her lace, which made her hide it under her apron with a fearsome look in her dull eyes. He hated her in a lusty, roaring fashion, as a healthy beef boy hates a sick cat and torments it to madness. When she displeased him, he beat her and knocked her frail form on the floor. The children could tell when this had happened. Her eyes would be red, and there would be blue marks on her face and neck. Poor Mrs. Tony, they would say, and nestle close to her. Tony did not roar at her for petting them, perhaps because they spent money on the multi-hued candy in glass jars on the shelves. Her mother appeared upon the scene once and stayed a short time, but Tony got drunk one day and beat her because she ate too much, and she disappeared soon after. Whence she came and where she departed, no one could tell, not even Mrs. Murphy, the Polly Pry and Gazette of the block. Tony had gout, and suffered for many days in roaring helplessness, the while his foot, bound and swathed in many folds of red flannel, lay on the chair before him. In proportion as his gout increased and he bawled from pure physical discomfort, she became light-hearted and moved about the shop with real brisk cheeriness. He could not hit her then, without such pain that after one or two trials he gave up in disgust. So the dull years had passed, and life had gone on pretty much the same for Tony and the German wife and the shop. The children came on Sunday evenings to buy the stick candy, and on weekdays for coal and wood. The servants came to buy oysters for the larger houses, and to gossip over the counter about their employers. The little dry woman knitted, and the big man moved lazily in and out of his red flannel shirt, exchanged politics with the tailor next door through the window, or lounged into Mrs. Murphy's bar and drank fiercely. Some of the children grew up and moved away, and other little girls came to buy candy and eat pink lanyap fishes, and the shop still thrived. One day, Tony was ill, more than the mummied foot of gout or the wheeze of asthma. He must keep his bed and send for the doctor. She clutched his arm when he came and pulled him into the tiny room. Is, is, it, is it anything much, doctor? She gasped. Escalapius shook his head as wisely as the occasion would permit. She followed him out of the room and into the shop. Do you... Will he get well, doctor? Escalapius buttoned up his frock coat, smoothed his shiny hat, cleared his throat, then replied oracularly, Madam, he is completely burned out inside. Empty as a shell, madam, empty as a shell. He cannot live, for he has nothing to live on. As the cobblestones rattled under the doctor's equipage, rolling leisurely up Britannia Street, Tony's wife sat in her chair and laughed, laughed with a hearty joyousness that lifted the film from the dull eyes and disclosed a sparkle beneath. The drear days went by, and Tony lay like a veritable Samson shorn of his strength, for his voice was sunken to a hoarse, sibilant whisper, and his black eyes gazed fiercely from the shock of hair and beard about a white face. Life went on pretty much as before in the shop, the children passed to ask how Mr. Tony was, and even hushed the jingles on their bell hoops as they passed the door. Red-headed Jimmy, Mrs. Murphy's nephew, 
did the hard jobs, such as splitting wood and lifting coal from the bin, and in the intervals between tending the fallen giant and waiting on the customers, Tony's wife sat in her accustomed chair, knitting fiercely, with an inscrutable smile about her purple, compressed mouth. Then John came, introducing himself, serpent-wise, into the Eden of her bosom. John was Tony's brother, huge and bluff, too, but fair and blonde, with the beauty of northern Italy. With the same lack of race pride which Tony had displayed in selecting his German spouse, John had taken unto him Betty, a daughter of Aaron, aggressive, powerful, and cross-eyed. He turned up now, having heard of this illness, and assumed an air of remarkable authority at once. A hunted look stole into the dull eyes, and after John had departed with blustering directions as to Tony's welfare, she crept to his bedside timidly. Tony, she said, Tony, you are very sick. An inarticulate growl was the only response. Tony, you ought to see the priest. You mustn't go any longer without taking the sacrament. The growl deepened into words. Don't want any priest. You're always after some sniveling old woman's fuss. You and Mrs. Murphy go on with your church. It won't make you any better. She shivered under this parting shot and crept back into the shop. Still, the priest came next day. She followed him into the bedside and knelt timidly. Tony, she whispered, here's Father LeBlanc. Tony was too languid to curse out loud. He only expressed his hate in a toss of the black beard and shaggy mane. Tony, she said nervously, won't you do it now? It won't take long, and it will be better for you when you go. Oh, Tony, don't, don't laugh. Please, Tony, here's the priest. But the titan roared aloud. No, get it? Think I'm going to give you a chance to grab my money now? Let me die and go to hell in peace. Father LeBlanc knelt meekly and prayed, and the woman's weak pleadings continued. Tony, I've been true and good and faithful to you. Don't die and leave me no better than before. Tony, I do want to be a good woman once, a real for true married woman. Tony, here's the priest. Say yes. And she wrung her ringless hands. You want my money, said Tony slowly. And you shan't have it. Not a cent. John shall have it. Father LeBlanc shrank away like a faded specter. He came next day, and next day, only to see reenacted the same piteous scene, the woman pleading to be made a wife ere death hushed Tony's blasphemies, the man chuckling in pain-racked glee at the prospect of her bereaved misery. Not all the prayers of Father LeBlanc nor the wailings of Mrs. Murphy could alter the determination of the will beneath the shock of hair. He gloated in his physical weakness at the tenacious grasp on his mentality. Tony, she wailed on the last day, her voice rising to a shriek in its eagerness. Tell them I'm your wife. It'll be the same. Only say it, Tony, before you die. He raised his head and turned stiff eyes and gibbering mouth on her. Then with one chill finger pointing at John, fell back dully and heavily. They buried him with many honors by the Society of Italia's Sons. John took possession of the shop when they returned home and found the money hidden in the chimney corner. As for Tony's wife, since she was not his wife after all, they sent her forth in the world penniless, her worn fingers clutching her bundle of clothes in nervous agitation, as though they regretted the time lost from knitting. And now, by the Bayou St. John. The Bayou St. John slowly makes its dark-hued way through reeds and rushes, high banks and flat slopes, 
until it casts itself into the turbulent bosom of Lake Pontchartrain. It is dark, like the passionate women of Egypt, placid, like their broad brows, deep, silent, like their souls. Within its bosom are hidden romances and stories such as were sung by minstrels of old. From the source to the mouth is not far distant, visibly speaking, but in the life of the bayou a hundred heart-miles could scarcely measure it. Just where it winds about the northwest of the city are some of its most beautiful bits, orange groves on one side and quaint old Spanish gardens on the other. Who cares that the bridges are modern and that here and there pert boathouses rear their prim heads? It is the bayou, even though it be invaded with the ruthless vandalism of the improving idea. And can a boathouse kill the beauty of a moss-grown centurion of oak with a history as old as the city? Can an iron bridge with tarantula piers detract from the song of a mockingbird in a fragrant orange grove? We know that farther out, past the Confederate soldier's home, that rose-embowered rambling place of gray-coated white-haired old men with broken hearts for a lost cause— it flows unimpeded by the faintest conception of man, and we love it all the more that, like the priestess of Isis, it is calm-browed even in indignity. To its banks at the end of Moss Street, one day there came a man and a maiden. They were both tall and lithe and slender, with the agility of youth and fire. He was the final concentration of the essence of Spanish passion filtered into an American frame. She, a repressed southern exotic, trying to fit itself into the niches of a modern civilization. Truly a fitting couple to seek the bayou banks. They climbed the levee that stretched a feeble check to waters that seldom rise, and on the other side of the embankment, at the brink of the river, she sat on a log and impatiently pulled off the little cap she wore. The skies were gray, heavy, overcast, with an occasional wind rift in the clouds, that only revealed new depths of grayness behind. The tideless waters murmured a faint ripple against the logs and jutting beams of the breakwater, and were answered by the crescendo wail of dried reeds on the other bank, reeds that rustled and moaned among themselves for the golden days of summer sunshine. He stood up, his dark form a slender silhouette against the sky. She looked upward from her log, and their eyes met, with an exquisite shock of recognizing understanding. Dark eyes into dark eyes. Iberian fire into Iberian fire. Soul unto soul. It was enough. He sat down and took her into his arms, and in the eerie murmur of the storm coming, they talked of the future. And then I hope to go to Italy or France— it is only there, beneath those far southern skies, that I could ever hope to attain anything that the soul within me says I can. I have wasted so much time in the mere struggle for bread, while the powers of a higher calling have clamored for recognition and expression. I will go some day and redeem myself. She was silent a moment, watching with half-closed lids a dejected-looking hunter on the other bank and a lean dog who trailed through the reeds behind him, with drooping tail. Then she asked, And I, what will become of me? You, Athanasia, there is a great future before you, little woman, and I and my love can only mar it. Try to forget me and go on your way. I am only the epitome of unhappiness and ill success. But she laughed and would have none of it. Will you ever forget that day, Athanasia? How the little gammons, creole throughout, came half shyly near the log, fishing and exchanging furtive whispers and half-concealed glances at the silent couple. Their angling was rewarded only by a black water moccasin that wriggled and forked its venomous red tongue in an attempt to exercise its death-dealing prerogative. This, Athanasia, insisted must go back into its native black waters, and paid the price the boys asked that it might enjoy its freedom. The gamins laughed and chattered in their soft patois. The dawn smiled tenderly upon Athanasia, and she durst not look at the reeds as she talked, 
lest their crescendo's sadness yield a foreboding. Just then, a wee girl appeared, clad in a multi-hued garment, evidently a sister to the small fisherman. Her keen black eyes, set in a dusky face, glanced sharply and suspiciously at the group as she clambered over the wet embankment, and it seemed the drizzling mist grew colder, the sobbing wind more pronounced in its prophetic wail. Athanasia rose suddenly. Let us go, she said. The eternal feminine has spoiled it all. The bayou flows as calmly and darkly, as full of hidden passions as ever. On a night years after, the moon was shining upon it with a silvery tenderness that seemed brighter, more carelessly lingering than anywhere within the old city. Behind there rose the spires and towers. Before, the reeds, green now, and soft in their rustlings and whispers for the future. False reeds. They tell themselves of their happiness to be, and it all ends in dry stalks and drizzling skies. The mockingbird in the fragrant orange grove sends out his night song and blends it with the cricket's chirp as the blossoms of orange and magnolia mingle their perfume with the earthly smell of a summer rain just blown over. Perfect in its stillness, absolute in its beauty, tenderly healing in its suggestion of peace, the night in its clear-lighted, cloudless sweetness enfolds Athanasia as she stands on the levee and gazes down at the old log, now almost hidden in the luxuriant grass. It was the eternal feminine that spoiled our dream that day, as it spoiled the afterlife, was it not? But the Bayou St. John did not answer. It merely gathered into its silent bosom another broken-hearted romance and flowed dispassionately on its way. And those are our stories for this evening. I hope you enjoyed Sister Josepha, Tati, Tony's wife, and By the Bayou St. John by Alice Dunbar Nelson. Thank you for listening. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time.